What's happening, everybody, and welcome to this mini lecture on the elements of drama. Uh, before we get started, I do want to point out that um, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in previous mini lectures, like symbols, figurative language, theme, plot, character, uh, these are all very much applicable to drama um, as well as to fiction. Uh, but in this video, what we're going to be talking about is just a few of the elements that really separate this literary genre from fiction and poetry. So uh, one of the things that we see, literally see, that separates drama is what's on the page. Um, unlike with fiction, it's not just, you know, a paragraph form. It's a, often a lot more than uh, what we see when we're reading poems. Um, and two of the things that really make, like two of the, the, the stylistic form things that really make fiction, or uh, sorry, drama different are stage directions and character tags. Stage directions are um, often italicized. We see them kind of at the begin, at the very beginning of a play, and you know sometimes between, uh, you know, kind of showing what characters are doing or how they're talking. What they are is their directions from the playwright to the director and the actors on how to put how to put the play on stage. Uh, this can contain everything from set descriptions to uh, settings to uh you know, describing how the characters talk um to where they move to you know action to uh you know when when characters enter or exit you know this is this is the those directions that show how the play progresses character tags on the other hand uh these are they're really just kind of like name tags for when the characters are speaking um again because we don't have a narrator in fiction or in god i keep saying that in drama we don't have a narrator in drama uh rather we just have to we have to rely on you know paying attention to these tags telling us when our different characters are speaking so speaking of speaking who is talking and how and there are primarily four different types of speech when it comes to reading a play there's dialogue and this is you know our you know general conversation that we see between characters on stage uh, and very important because it's between characters on stage they're talking to each other um at least two characters involved here monologues on the other hand are when one character delivers an extended speech while there's other characters listening they just sit and they're they're talking to a character to the other characters for an extended period of time um we see this in a lot of movies uh, particularly a lot of like like james bond movies where the villain is you know talking at length about his great plan to you know overthrow bond or whatever um he's he's monologuing they're, they're they're talking at length to other characters um this is different from soliloquy because a soliloquy is also an, an an extended speech by a character uh by a single character but the important you know the 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 difference between soliloquies and monologues are soliloquies are delivered while the character's alone on stage and what these do is they give us a uh a look into the character's psyche we unlike with fiction when we're when we're you know watching a play or reading a play it's it's important to remember that we don't get a narrator telling us what these characters think and feel the only way we know what the characters are thinking or feeling is if they tell us and so soliloquies are pretty much the way that we get inside a character's head we get to see their inner monologue we get to see their thought processes um and then finally here there's asides and these are um used in a number of different ways uh sometimes an aside is directed between characters like uh there's a moment in uh macbeth where uh banquo this uh says an aside to macbeth despite the fact that there are other people on stage at the same time we are meant to understand that only macbeth can hear him it's kind of like he's whispering in his ears um an aside might be where there's a bunch of characters on stage but like the the main the main baddie kind of turns and he's all like Mwahaha, now she's in my power like clearly the other characters the other actors on stage heard this person say that but we are meant to understand that they can't 
that's that's really what an aside is and I say this and I bring this up because it's really important because when we are reading a play we have to remember that we are reading something that was meant to be performed on stage we're reading something that was not meant to be looked at purely on a page and so sets and stages and settings these are really important um because that's it's we we have to remember that that it's you know this these are these events are meant to take place in a physical world um as far as to us like set descriptions and stages are and 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 really you know like going to a play is concerned audience imagination is enormously important um quite just simply because we you know you can't do like you can't have hulk running through new york and bashing all of the you know chitari warriors or whatever like we did at the end of the the avengers um because uh you, you, you can't do that on a stage it's just not possible um so we have to you know have you know we the audience really participates a lot um one of the way uh the the ways that we find out where like and 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 we buy into where things are when things are how things are set up uh setting is conveyed to us in three primary ways could be speech the characters can tell us when and where they are like ah yes we are here in denmark we're at castle El uh, castle elsinore um and the king has died like okay cool uh, that's where we are this is what's going on we're good uh you could find out by costume um you know what characters are wearing can sometimes tell us where we are uh for instance uh to go back to hamlet here the uh opening scene takes place at a watchtower first person we see is a guy in a guard outfit like that 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 costume would tell us where we are um and finally set design i think set design has changed a lot over the the, the centuries and really over the millennia um going from like super bare bones in ancient athens up through you know the globe which we we've got here uh to you know uh more minimalist more involved uh you know but the way that a set is designed the way that a set is laid out um can tell us a lot about when and where we are um do we see really old phones do we see you know tvs you know what do you what have you what we the way the way that a set is designed on stage can tell us a lot about when or where a play is taking place now um talking about time and i want to get a little bit into and i want to close this uh this video out with a short discussion of kind of two primarily like theoretical aspects of drama um the first being the the idea of the classical unities and uh aristotle was a greek philosopher um and this uh this idea of the the unities of time place and action uh came from his on poetry and uh the unity of time basically and and what what these what these kind of unities basically said was that uh in order to have a complete and functional piece of drama the the play had to abide by these three things um unity of time said that all of the action of a play had to take place over a single day unity of place so that all of that action that was taking place over a single day had to happen at a single location and unity of action meant that everything happening over the course of one day taking place in one primary spot had to follow one primary plot line now i bring this up because we we do see a lot of plays still very much following this but these aren't like the end-all be-all rules of drama um we see you know playwrights as early as shakespeare breaking this all the time uh, and even before him so it's an important theory it's a thought it's it's something to kind of keep in mind but it's also important to remember that this it's it's not a set in stone rule um just like this idea of comedy and tragedy uh in, in classical theory um there are really pri uh, two primary genres of drama there's comedy and there's tragedy um 
comedy doesn't necessarily mean uh you know like book smart or or or, or the the uh you know friends or you know anything that's going to be making us laugh uh in the way that we think about comedy now um it's comedy really refers to anything that's not tragedy tragedy being seen as sort of like the the high art form of drama whereas comedy was like you know the, the stuff for the masses or whatever so um let's talk about what makes something a tragedy because it does in classical theory classical tragedy has some pretty uh strict and straightforward rules for it um the characters in a classical tragedy have to be of the noble class because that increases the like the tragic fall that these characters undergo has to be you know like a major change in life situation hamlet is a is is the prince of denmark and to see him fall in the way that he does like that's that's huge um you know romeo and juliet uh, son and daughter of noble families again their fall is 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 huge this is why um a lot of folks uh would consider something like arthur miller's death of a salesman to not be considered classical tragedy uh willie loman's death despite you know being what we would you know in our sort of contemporary use of the word call tragic is you know he doesn't really fall that far like he's a lower middle class dude who's been kind of crapped on all his life um like he 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 doesn't really fall all that far um so you know in in, in a classical sense it's not really all that tragic um in classical tra uh tragedy uh the main character has to have a tragic flaw they have to have something some aspect of their personality that causes them you know that 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 pushes them towards this fall that they undergo uh, a lot of folks have said that hamlet's tragic flaw is his indecisiveness his inability to act he can't make a decision and so he waits until it's too late for him to do anything um not sure i buy that but the, that's that's a conversation for another time um in oedipus the king oedipus's uh tragic flaw is hubris he thinks that he can defy fate uh defy prophecy and make his own life uh speaking of prophecy another aspect of uh classic tragedy is that there are tend to be supernatural forces involved things like fate things like the gods things you know some 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 extra human force needs to uh to you know play a role here and one way that this happens especially in uh ancient greek theater is through a, pro a process called deus ex machina it uh quite literally means the god machine and in classic tragic uh classic plays this um would manifest itself like they would literally like wheel a like like lower a god down in a machine like, you know like a thing um and it would show up at the very end of the play right when things were totally like totally crazy and they would you know magically tie everything back together and all the problems would be solved and the play would be over hooray uh we don't really do this anymore but uh deus ex machina in our contemporary usage has come to be used as uh, a term that describes like any imp like super improbable thing that happens and saves the day um and i think my favorite use of of this uh in a very self-conscious kind of meta way is at the very end of um dodgeball a true underdog story when right as like average joes they've won uh they've won the dodgeball tournament but white goodman he comes and he's like ah oh, lefleur you actually sold me your gym last night ha 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 you're screwed and uh P you know vince vaughn's character peter he you know was like oh well actually what about i i bet all the money and they they wheel this like treasure chest in and it's filled with money and on the treasure chest is you know like right where the buckle would be is a plaque that says deus ex machina it's great <laughs> um and uh the, the the last term on the on this slide here is uh catharsis and this is the uh sort of emotional release that we are meant to experience when we watch a a tragedy uh ancient tragedy uh tragedy was supposed to be what uh 
didactic. It's supposed to teach us something. It's supposed to to uh, instruct us basically how not to behave. It gives us kind of a model for like, hey, you know, humans can suck. Don't do this. Um, and that that catharsis is that emotional release that we undergo, that we experience. It uh, it 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 helps us learn. And uh, we're supposed to kind of feel purged at the end, like after witnessing these horrible things, we're supposed to, you know, leave feeling thoughtful and, you know, and enlightened. But anyway, that about does it for this one. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.